Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi, we explore how and why. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. And uh, we didn't watch a movie. Or we may have, but it's none of your business. Because this week it's Q&A. <laughs> Decipher sci-fi, we're not telling you. No, you have to ask us some stuff and then we'll tell you about that. Oh, so we are telling you. Yeah, we're telling you something. And we have some questions. And I've collected... The thing with the Q&A is I collect some questions either from people who ask us stuff or because I ran across a question that had nothing to do with us and I decided we were fit to talk about it. So... uh there's no spoiler alert because we're not going to spoil the movie and we can just jump right into questions. This is Fraser Kane of Universe Today and a bunch of stuff. So could you have x-ray vision? Could you have x-ray detectors in your head? Um, uh, Ghost in the Shell. I don't know if you saw Oh yeah, Batu or whatever? Yeah, Batu gets his, gets his eyes swapped out with uh, cameras because like, why not? You know, you've had your eyes blasted off, why not get cameras? That I'm into, and, right? I totally see how that would work. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way, but maybe that's the thing Riddick would be dealing with. Although for some reason, it's they're always light amplification all the time, such that he wears like welding goggles when it is light. Mm-hmm. I guess it's a trade-off. For sure. And so I think for depending on if, if your life is living in dark prisons, then that sounds like, you know, like a prison tattoo. That sounds like a like a, a risk you're willing to take. Yeah, maybe he and was in for the long haul as far as he thought. Yeah. Yeah, he thought he was going to be there for a long time, and he was sick of stumbling around in the dark and wanted to have a leg up on the competition so he didn't get shivved. And it looked like he had a larger spectrum that he could see. It wasn't just more light was coming in, but rather he was able to see more of the spectrum or was sensitive to it. Oh, it, it remained an amplifying device, but also for a wider portion of EM, mm-hmm. perhaps, or shifted in one direction or another, right? Who knows? Right? Yeah, the thing is, is that, you know, we have the ability to sense wavelengths other than light, right? Other than visible light. Um, we, we have like, ultraviolet sensors in that we can get a sunburn, mm-hmm. right? So we know, right? It's a long term sensor, but eventually a, I get the idea. It takes idea. a little while, but you'll know, <laughs> you'll be able to figure out where the ultraviolet radiation is coming from. But the other one is heat, of course, right? That infrared radiation, when you feel heat with your hands, you are feeling electromagnetic radiation that is that is coming at you, right? That is the that is the the temper, and it's a little more complicated than that because it's sort of the convection of the of the of the temperature that's moving through the air. But you're feeling that that infrared radiation. Well, right. Like think of the original experiment that demonstrated infrared as a part of the spectrum, right? Yeah. splitting light out of a prism into the rainbow. And then on the end after red, invisibly, there's this very hot band that you cannot see with your eyeballs so much. Yeah. And so when you wear night vision goggles, for example, and they're, and they're going to show you infrared, all it's doing is it's bringing in infrared and it's turning it into a color that your eyeballs can see in the visible spectrum. And so you can, that's how this would work, is that you would have some kind of cybernetic eyeballs that would that would allow you to, that would capture these other wavelengths outside of the spectrum that the human eye can see, as well as the ones that the human eye can see, Mm -hmm. would then convert them into, uh, it would would translate them to your brain in a way that you can then perceive them. Or if you're like Geordi, you know, from Star Trek, you've got even more. You got radio waves and microwaves and all kinds of things you can see. Which, yeah, for keeping in mind, like that's actually part of the same spectrum as all the other things we're talking about, just harder to capture in a tiny eyeball thing. Yeah, it's all just like, yeah, if you're willing to replace your eyeballs with huge radio dishes. <laughs> it's hard to get around. <laughs> then then you could see uh, into the radio spectrum as well. Right, but in that case, that's it's funny that you said that, but like actually think about it for the audience. Like visualize, you would need a receptor for a wavelength like you're going to need something large enough to actually capture that. It, so you're limited. It depends what you want to see. It yeah. just depends what you want to see, right? If you want to see gamma radiation or X-ray radiation, you've got your work cut out for you. It's a it's a very complicated technique to try and detect those particles, d- detect those wavelengths because they're they're uh, they have so much uh, such high energy. So actually, you know, uh, gamma ray telescopes and X-ray telescopes work differently than visible light and telescopes. What do you mean work differently? Oh. 
Well, but so so the way that a you know the way a normal uh, telescope works, say you know like a one that's going to see in the visible spectrum is mm -hmm. you know it's a curved mirror or it's a lens and it focuses the light onto a smaller area and then you're able to right, so see capturing that, as many photons as possible with a large bucket into a smaller bucket. Yeah, okay. exactly. And so the problem is that you can't make say gamma radiation or X-ray radiation bounce or focus in the same way that you can with visible light. Uh -huh. So actually what a lot of those space telescopes are is they're sort of like funnels. And so they funnel down by catching these rays on this very sort of uh, high angle and they, they'll, they'll be able to deflect them a little bit down into this sensor that they're then able to capture and, and be able to sense where there's a, a higher amount of X-ray radiation or gamma radiation. But it's a, it's a different kind of thing. It's not like a telescope that can detect gamma rays. It, I mean, it is a different kind of instrument, more like a funnel, less like a telescope. And these things need be much larger than, you know, our, our optical mechanisms, right? Well, it depends on how many gamma rays you want to be able to see. Huh. So if you want to see a lot of them, you're going to need a, a big collecting area that's going to be able to to focus or be able to to funnel down these these photons. Mm -hmm. But if and but we've seen, you know, for radio waves, I mean, your phone can detect radio waves from the cell towers, right, with a, with an antenna. Yeah. And so and so that's a different kind of detector, right? You can use an antenna to detect radio waves. And yet radio waves and infrared and visible light, and they're all the same thing. They're all just different versions of the wavelength. And so a different detector does the job at different different levels of energy. Yeah. For the yeah, for the different wavelengths that you're dealing with. But I'm thinking of actually Batu now in terms of like how his small eyeball thing. Like, did he need to have giant ugly funnels on his face in order to capture x-ray? Because he had x-ray vision. Well, the entire eye would now be the collector. But it depends on how many you need, right? Like, like have you ever gotten a, you know, you get an, an x-ray at the dentist and they, it's a small little collector area, you know, and so in, and you can see a picture inside your teeth. So, yeah, right. but the point is that the, the emitter of the x-rays is very close to your, and detector. very concentrated, right? right? Yeah. And so if you, you know, if you are willing to get really close to where you think there's a source of x-rays, um, then you don't have to have a very big detector and you can get really close, but obviously there's the cancer, but then you don't have to worry about it because you don't have eyeballs anymore. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. That's, that's one reason not to have an X not to try to deal with x-rays too much is you just want to get out of the way of the x-rays don't put it yeah, in your head but you and but you can't get X, you can't get tumors in your eyeballs anymore because you don't have eyeballs mm, you do have right. that brain right behind it yeah it is in yeah, proximity else. adrian's been on the show a bunch and it's adrian falcone let's do it adrian i have a question for you yes what if numbers are wrong further detail this was, is a question from Cora. So even if it sounds silly, what if there's a more accurate mathematical representation of the world other than numbers? I can't come up with any, and the method of numbers we currently have appears to be really extremely rational, but I've entertained that thought for a long time. I'd like to know what you have to say about it. Is that even a reasonable question? It is a reasonable question, and we actually have a ton of different number systems that are not numbers, like um, two by two matrices, uh, the quaternions, um, the combinatorial game theory numbers that you and I were playing with. Um, oh. There are a bunch of different ways you can represent the world. Um, one of the classes I'm taking right now is called Modern Algebra, where we actually look at objects that may or may not model the numbers, but we look at the theories behind them and, uh, and come up with all types of things. So what if numbers are wrong? You're saying it's okay because we have a bunch of other things? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Numbers may be wrong for a specific purpose, but um, yeah, you just build another system. So just less accurate representation of what you're trying to yeah. accomplish. Uh, so if you're working with 2D rotations, um, you can use the complex numbers, or you can use 2x2 two two matrices, a certain subset of 2x2 two two matrices. So I thought that would be a more like... <laughs> It bad wants. not even like it's a harder question for adrian just like it was going to make less sense and be less answerable just and he was just like, like yeah this is a big deal really reasonable answer <laughs> uh it probably comes from someone who's like 0.99999 is not equal to one here let me show you how not even it's actually i i identify with this question like what if numbers are wrong what if numbers are wrong i don't know how numbers work <laughs> <laughs> then you use something uh more appropriate um, Next question. The, well, that was actually it. There's a story by Ted Chang called Division by Zero that I'm going to spoil a little bit, where in the story, 
And this is what I thought was really interesting as a person who doesn't understand how numbers work. In the story, spoiler alert, the mathematician proves that like one plus two. One is... equals two. Yeah, I read that one. It was okay. in the collection. Story of my life. And exactly. Yeah. And, and the punchline of it was like, everyone's like, eh, whatever. And life just goes on. It has nothing. It does, has no effect on anybody or anything. So I just read a book called Faith Physics, which is kind of a satirical, weird thing. Um, and in it, they discover that the afterlife is a real thing, a physically quantifiable thing, and they make contact with, with souls and stuff. And one of the things that comes out of it is called the false induction paradox, which is why did science work so well before we knew there was an afterlife? And the obvious answer is, well, yeah, why wouldn't it? So it was it was a weird thing. There was a lot of cynicism in the book, but kind of the same thing. Cynicism is not usually my jam, but I like the idea. That sounds like a thing I could use some thinking about. I heard it um, advertised on uh, The Greatest Generation, which is that Star Trek podcast I listen to. I thought this was going to be something more along the lines of when you were on our arrival episode and we're like, hey, physics, like, what if physics was wrong? Like, how do these aliens have different physics and it's crazy? And that was actually much harder, I guess. It was, it was actually a more difficult question. But in this case, if numbers are wrong, they're arbitrary anyway, and I guess it doesn't matter. I mean, if, if you want the deeper question, like what if there is a flaw in how we built logic so that you can lead to stuff like one right. equals two? Is the actual question, what if logic was wrong? We've, we've, we've run into that several times before. I mean, there are... Really? Come on. There are so many paradoxes. Um, <laughs> set theory had, um, had the... Oh, shit, which one is it? I forget which one it is, but it's basically the statement like, this set contains all sets that don't contain themselves. Does it contain itself? Anyway, <laughs> there, there, um, if you run into a paradox, then you just yes. go back to your assumptions and rework them. It's happened several times before. It's, it's an interesting question. It leads to really interesting math and philosophy and stuff, but... At the end of the day, you just work through it. It's less complicated than I thought. Yeah. Like in the Ted Chang story that I would like to recommend. Anyway. Way to be ahead of the curve, Ted. That's your really boring answer. No, that was good. Okay, cool. <laughs> Defying expectations, Adrian. Yeah, way to drop some Excellent. knowledge. And then, so we brought Dan on. Dan. Shit, who's Dan? We brought Daniel James Barker on of Uncertainty Principle Podcast to help us answer a physics question. The question, Dan, is from Cora. Yes. What if black holes didn't exist? <laughs> what if black holes didn't exist? Yeah, I brought you in because I don't have enough physics to probably adequately answer this. Um, All I have is physics would be very different if that were the case, right? Yeah, I I think so. So th there would be a few consequences of there not being black holes. Um, one of them is that galaxies... I'm not sure that they would form in the same way that they do because pretty much every every big galaxy that we see has a supermassive black hole at the center of it. Right. So that mass would be spread over a much larger space, say? I think so. Or, or they would just have a harder time. They might just have a harder time like uh, coalescing into into these things. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on that front. Uh, one, one thing I can uh, I can say is that it would have certain consequences about how stars form um, because the, uh, or, or how they evolve, sorry. The, um, uh, in stellar evolution, you know, star, stars are born from a gas cloud collapsing and condensing into a, uh, a giant piece of plasma that's burning like, like the sun is. And then, uh, and then uh, eventually they, they burn through all their fuel um, and then they reach the end of their life cycle. And there's a few ways that that can happen. Uh, with our sun, uh, it will eventually sort of expand and just like throw out its stuff into uh, into space. Um, more massive stars that actually don't live as long as stars like our sun because they're burning through their fuel so much faster. It's better to burn out than to fade away. Yeah. <laughs> well, not, if, not if you have people living on a planet near you. But, yeah, I mean, depends on your perspective. Some some of them will go into supernova, which is where they just explode in in an enormous explosion and in I'm, a super it, fashion. It, yeah, there it's definitely the technical term. <laughs> Big explosion. Um, all of their their outer layers are just like thrown out into space. Um, and what you're left with, uh, what you can be left with, is the 
is like dwarf stars uh, or, or white dwarfs. And um, and on the more extreme end of that, you can be left with neutron stars. But, but uh, on to uh, what that has to do with black holes. Right. Black, black holes are sort of the next step. If a star is massive enough, instead of just collapsing into this super dense core, that collapse continues, and then all of the all of the matter just keeps pushing and pushing itself into and into itself, and then sort of um, just collapsing into a singularity that has uh, no volume. As a single point in three dimensional space. Yeah. An infinitely small point, uh, point with no volume that has infinite density. And then you get a black hole. You get an object that has such a strong gravitational field that light isn't going fast enough to reach escape velocity from the object. So, so if those didn't exist, that would imply that, um, that could imply a few things. Either, you know, um, objects just uh, stars couldn't get that massive. But what would stop them? Like the way you've described it, basically, we're talking about the black hole being there's an upper limit on a ratio of mass and density where it just stops being normal and goes into a crazy thing. Right. That crazy thing is the black hole. It's like the upper limit on that. So if we don't have it, where would it end? It my I guess it would have to end at like a neutron star. You the if black holes couldn't form and therefore they didn't and they didn't exist that that followed from that then you're left with the universe with a different set of laws of physics where the the forces between particles isn't you know forcing them together uh beyond a certain point because you know we get a black hole when everything's just push uh, is is being forced together by by gravity and the nuclear forces. And so if black holes couldn't exist, and that that means that the laws of gravity and the laws of nuclear forces actually have to be different. Because in fact, we didn't even um you can show without without invoking relativity that um uh that uh, a black hole could exist. If you just use Newton's law of gravitation and derive the escape velocity, uh, for an object of a certain mass, then you could set the escape velocity to be greater than the speed of light and then just find out what the mass and the radius of the object could be for that. So that would um, imply that there there would be no mass in no space that would yield an escape velocity of greater than the speed of light because that's pretty much what a black hole is that's why getting information from them is so hard because their escape you have to go faster than the speed of light to get away from them so if if black holes didn't exist then that would mean that the the entire foundation of our understanding of gravity would have to be completely different thus the universe wouldn't be the universe that it is thus yeah we'd the, probably not be speaking Probably not, because everything, everything that we know about the universe is so particular. Um, the the universe that we live in, in order for us to survive in it, has to have some very specific rules. I mean, it's almost like it was made here just for us, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> so physics would be different. Physics would have to be different. It's the TLDR. It's kind of it's like vis a vis of if you change physics, what would be different? <laughs> Everything would be different if you change physics. Ah, glad we got to the bottom of that. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. My brother, my brother, the chemical engineer, I called him because I need to know about the chemistry of gasoline. <laughs> yeah, a chemical engineer is not a chemist, not even a little bit. Anyway, what do you know about gasoline? We're talking about zombie apocalypse, right? And we're wondering about. Uh, how how it would spoil, how it could still be used, different types of engines and how they would better handle the thing that happens when gas spoils. I don't actually know what spoils means in terms of gasoline. And then on top of that, what could you do to get around this problem if the zombie apocalypse happens to you and there's lots of gas about? So uh, basically you're just saying you're running low on gasoline because it's the zombie apocalypse? No. How do you conserve gasoline? 
Not conserve. No, it's called don't use too much. There's plenty of it about, but it spoils. I feel like you didn't listen to anything I said. So pretty much how <laughs> long does it keep? Like, could you somehow make gasoline keep for 10 years? Were you aware that gas spoiled? You're a <laughs> chemist. <laughs> <laughs> It depends on the quality of the of the bonds and the quality of the gasoline, and it depends on what kind of environment you keep it under. If you keep gasoline under a nitrogen environment on like in a uh, glass lined vessel, it would it should last theoretically forever. You're saying glass lined and as in order to not react with the metal container? Yeah, it, it can't react with there, it. There's no it's a non reactive environment. Right, so porcelain glass or something. Yeah, glass with no air means there's nothing for the carbon to react with. What is spoiling and gas? How? Do, what does that even mean? What is the spoilage of gas? It's basically oxidation and like electrolysis. You just the the bonds in the gasoline just start reacting with you a lot. Usually the water, the water in the air is probably a major one. And the other thing is the vapor pressure of gasoline is so low that if you leave it free to the a free in a non pressured vessel, it'll eventually just wither away. Oh right, it would just it would uh, evaporate very quickly. Is that what you're Pretty saying? quickly. The vapor pressure of uh, C8 to C11 is not that bad, but it'd be gone. It would definitely wouldn't last a year in an open environment. Okay, but in the case where we're actually, the context is we're talking about the movie I Am Legend. The, in the case of I Am Legend, do you remember Will Smith? Yeah. Yeah. He is all alone and the zombies don't need gas. So he's just pumping out of the gas stations. It is stored underground underneath the gas station in the tank. The nature of that storage... It might not be like vacuumed out or filled with nitrogen, but it's it's sealed, right? It's probably is uh, it probably is oxygen free. Oh yeah, down there is that is that a thing? Yeah, those containers are usually you pump nitrogen into it and then you fill it with gasoline and it displaces the nitrogen, but any leftover vapor space is is, is there, uh, air free. But then when you pump it out, it needs to draw air in. So I have no idea what the system is with the drawing air drawing in vapor when you're pumping it out. You have to displace volume. So maybe over time it would eventually pull in air because otherwise it would pull a vacuum. Or maybe it's like a box of wine with a bag in it. it just kind of goes no, it's a giant metal <laughs> container. <laughs> <laughs> those those things are usually designed for full vacuum, but they have like a uh, like a vacuum breaker on them. But if you don't have a nitrogen supply, then they only, you can only pull from the air. So gas will spoil by that. You can keep the gas from spoiling. Any idea on timelines? No, because we don't. We, it doesn't happen. When you make we, gas, you you sell it. <laughs> yeah, there's a pretty high demand for gas. We store we store gasoline. There, there's no maximum storage spec on our gasoline. Because in real life, you would never ever imaginably get to three years or whatever. Yeah, I would never look into it because I think the most we would ever store for would be a month. Although we do have strategic reserves of oil. I guess. Yeah, and you could always process uh, heavier byproducts of gasoline into gasoline if you needed to. What you're what you're talking about here, though, it's not like oh, it's not like the the gasoline goes from usable to not usable. The quality of the, uh, I guess it would be the octane number would decrease over time, but you can it'll still be combustible. So then, what's going wrong with it as far as the engine is concerned, as it degrades? I, uh, your if your octane number is decreasing, you're basically changing the bond structure of the of the carbon. So I think you have more complex bonds at that point, and you're using up a lot of your free bonds, and forming more double bonds. I think is what ends up happening. So it's harder to, it's more difficult to break down. I think is what's happening. Break down. So explode. Break down meaning like if you put gasoline into an engine, you put it into the combustion chamber. You're supposed to be able to drop the piston on it and have it combust in the in the correct area under correct under the correct friction friction and pressure. But if it's not if it's of low quality and the bonds are too strong, that won't do the job. And that's what you hear knocking in your engine is low quality gasoline and low quality engine. So it impacts the compressibility or the reliability of compressibility of the gasoline. Yeah, it won't, and it will result in more in more soot. So you'll get more like carbon, residual carbon after it combusts. So you'll be left with like more shit. Okay. Now we know about gas. Thanks. What do you know about universal translators, Nick? 
Nick Farmer of linguistics and book writing. What about universal translators? It's a Star Trek thing that never is well enough explained. And I wonder if you had any academic angle on it where you could tell me how totally hopeless or totally doable it is. I mean, are we talking like universal translators, like you know, fictional, like the Babblefish? That's a or... little bit magic, but I was thinking about Star Trek when I came up with the, uh, uh, the question. Okay. Um, so if it's going to be only human languages, um, then, you know, I would say that when it comes to machine translation in general, it's never going to be perfect. I mean, we're getting better and better and it's getting to a point where, I mean, it's certainly useful. Um, but you know, there's always going to be stuff that cannot be translated for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, mainly because, uh, language changes too quickly for anybody to, you know, ever program something to keep up with it. I mean, even if you had a you know machine learning algorithm, it wouldn't, it can only, it can only do sort of take into account things that already have been spoken. Uh, it can't take into account things that are getting created on the spot. And, um, that's something that happens in language all the time, but we can certainly get very good. And that's for human languages. So, I mean, you know, maybe someday, yeah, like you, you know, if, if you're just dealing with informal conversations as opposed to like delicate, you know, negotiations, um, yeah, you could have some sort of translator going on, but, uh, human to alien languages. I mean, I don't know, like if we, <laughs> you, that's something where I think, I want to just uh, say, like, listen to the episode that we did on Arrival because we talk about yep. alien languages a lot there, and I think that it would take too long to recap all that. Yes, definitely. Uh, probably no universality in language across other species from other planets and solar systems, huh? Well, I or mean... we can't count on it, perhaps. Can't, can't count on it. Can't count. I think that... it. it I wouldn't be surprised if there was a certain amount of universality in the same way that like, you, you know, species can independently evolve, you know, similar things just because they're very useful. So, you know, I mean, uh, like convergent devolution, is that the word? Like, yeah, like eyes having evolved multiple times, wings having evolved multiple times, you know. And so maybe for a highly social and highly intelligent species, it just so happens that, you know, language is a very useful thing and that it may be that language kind of for reasons that we don't fully understand, it just kind of has to be some way. I, I don't really know if we have the means of testing this right now, but it's, it's theoretically something worth considering. On the other hand, it is also, in my mind, much more likely that there is not going to be like anything in common. <laughs> but the idea that there could be is you're giving me some really good thinking material here. Well, we already see on Earth multiple different forms of communication. I mean, yes, so like whales and dolphins, for instance, use various sounds, like sonar sounds. But then you have others that speak with or communicate with pheromones. Right. I guess that is our trails. best analog, isn't it? Like other creatures that are non-human that seem to communicate. And do they count as language? No. Nah, that's not language, though. What would I mean, define... Is that, a, is that too complicated to even answer, really? No, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, it's also one that just takes, like... Oh. <laughs> you know, a, lot, a lot of ink has been spilled. But I would say that, I mean, part of the difficulty is that um, we only have human language. And so, like, we can say, okay, well, it requires, like... I mean, the definition becomes a little bit circular. It's like because we don't have another language system that we can contrast it with. All we can say is that those other forms of communication are not nearly complicated or regular enough. <laughs> but I agree. I appreciate you helping us get to the bottom of this very unanswerable question and giving me the idea that like, maybe I could start thinking about the universality of language, literally universally as being a possibility. Like maybe intelligent communication tends to actually have certain characteristics. And I'm going to look yeah. for this in our fiction as we talk about it. Could be. Thanks, Nick. All right, guys. And that's the end of the questions. For now. 
we should get questions to us about stuff that isn't just like sci-fi nonsense. For maybe, later. maybe somebody would be interested in asking us a question about us one day. I don't know about that. And maybe someone would be interested in hearing the answer one day. I also don't know. <laughs> I'm not confident that I am interesting enough. So keep asking us questions about stuff that isn't us, perhaps. Can I anonymously ask you questions I know you want to be asked, but no people don't want to hear the answer to? What do you mean? For instance? So you'll feel like, oh, man. Be like, Chris, what's your favorite type of tea in Tazan and your favorite brewing method? <laughs> And that's that for now. I need to say something, Colbert. Okay, what's that? Support your creators. And I have a list of people who are totally amazing for helping support the show. You might recognize some of their names. They are Joe Ferraro, Dean at LHD Media, Nicholas Little Boy Lowe, Daniel the Amp Launder, Jeremy Boberemy, Andy P. at Bash 25 Comics, Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson, Peter Van Loon the Dutchman, Andrew Capitulo the Mighty, Jeff Fireman Schwartman, Chris Gennard, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Samuel Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Elad Avron, Josh F and G of Liberty Street Geek, Mr. Raygun Curly Phil, our Kobe FF Joe Ruppel, Alaric Dirk and Gunarm Superhero, Daniel Days Barker of Uncertainty Principle Podcast, and AJ Falcone of this podcast, and Alaric Dirk and Gunarm Superhero, John, Champion of Inquisitive Beavers, DJ and Terra Bang Moffat. I like the exclamation quest. DJ exclaim equester. Yeah. So he like yellingly ask you things. <laughs> and my mom and grandma Judy and magical inquiring unicorn Jolene Creighton. Thank you everybody for going to decipher to support the show and supporting the show. Let us also thank you for leading people to decipher sci-fi.com slash describe where they can find out how to listen and where to listen to our show. Yeah, man. We don't have, like, advertising, but your word of mouth will probably be the best possible advertising. For real, this week. Think of a person, if you could. Do us a favor and uh, share it with somebody. And that's the end of the show. Turn it off. But I, Stop you, recording. You know, like written language, you know, it's that's just a different modality. There's absolutely aside from the inconvenience of it, we don't there's no reason why we couldn't just write to each other. Actually, that's kind of what our society's turning into, just texting to each other all the time. Yep. Unless you're Chris, then you send GIFs. Yeah, nothing but GIFs all day. <laughs> <laughs> if I can help yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've noticed that. He lamented. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's okay. I just I, I I never know how to respond when someone sends me a GIF. It's like are they mocking me or are they being nice? Like, should I like try and shoot back with a funny remark or should I just ignore it? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I didn't realize I was putting you in that I'm too old to understand what's happening position on the internet that you just expressed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if I made you uncomfortable. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Um, but I'm not old. <laughs>